Welcome, everyone. It's great to see everyone here today. I'm Professor Brian Schmidt, the Vice Chancellor and President of the Australian National University, and welcome to Llewellyn Hall. Indeed, it is great to be here today uh, to welcome you all to our campus for the launch of something new for us, uh, Liquid Instruments Groundbreaking Technology in the form of some new products. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands and airways we're meeting here at Llewellyn Hall, the Ngunnawal Nambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. We are joined today by two special guests, ACT Chief Minister Andrew Barr and Australia's Chief Scientist, Dr. Kathy Foley. So thank you for uh, taking time out of this special event for us. I'd also uh, acknowledge everyone coming out today. It's a great uh, show of support. Uh, this has had uh, I think a long gestation and the support of many people to get here. And uh, it is, as I said, such a pleasure to see so many of you out today. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to invite ACT Chief Minister Andrew Barr to say a few words. Thank you, Andrew. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, Daununa, Daununawal, in the language of the Ngunnawal people, this is Ngunnawal country, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, and particularly thank uh, Brian for that introduction, uh, and to Professor Shaddock for the invitation uh, to be here today at the showcase uh, of liquid instruments, products, and capability. Liquid instruments epitomizes the attributes that Canberra is known for research and development, innovation, highly skilled people, collaboration, and the development of world-leading products. And one of the products to be showcased today, Moku Go, colloquially known as Lab in a Backpack, is an innovative solution uh, with the potential to revolutionise STEM education here in Canberra and across the world by enabling universities to provide quality education in technology fields such as engineering and physics, and to provide that to students remotely. Now, the ACT government regularly collaborates with local industry, research and tertiary sectors in our city to attract investment and to grow the established and emerging priority sectors of the ACT economy. Now, previously, Liquid Instruments has benefited uh, from local venture capital funds like the Canberra Business Development Fund and Australian Capital Ventures Limited, which were both supported by the ACT government. And more recently, through the government's priority investment program, we've supported a range of collaborative projects in a wide variety of industry sectors, space, agri-technology, renewable energy, biodiversity, uh, and advanced manufacturing. And so today, I'm delighted to be able to announce uh, the ACT government's priority investment program I will be funding Liquid Instruments to collaborate with the ANU and UNSW Canberra to further develop its products and to undertake advanced manufacturing activities here in Canberra. We see considerable merit in this type of support to industry because of the benefits it brings to the entire territory economy. That's also why we have established our Future Jobs Fund to support the tertiary, research and industry sectors uh, that are developing innovative world-class ideas, unlocking new opportunities, but most importantly, creating highly skilled and sustainable jobs for Canberrans. So I congratulate Liquid Instruments on reaching this stage of their exciting journey uh, and wish Dr. Ralph, Professor Shaddock and the entire Liquid Instruments team all the very best for the future. Thank you. Well, Chief Minister, that's uh, outstanding news. Uh, very uh, glad to hear about it. Uh, you know, Canberra has actually one of the highest rates of research and development uh, in not just Australia, but in the world. Huge amounts of startups per capita, as high as anywhere in Australia. And we have a very supportive uh, local government in uh, the ACT uh, territory government that is very innovative in its support of the sector. And from my, my perspective, it's a chance for us to continue to partner with the ACT government and build up a really dynamic set of companies and capabilities here in the, AC, in the ACT uh, for the benefit of 
us locally, but also uh, nationally. We have a great opportunity to create new innovative companies that will help Australia uh, in the years to come. So thank you so much, uh, Andrew. It's great to have you uh, here today. I'd like now to invite Dr. Kathy Foley, the chief scientist, to say a few words. And of course, Kathy is trying to figure out on a national scale how we keep doing things like we're launching today. Kathy. So hello everyone, and I too want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the Ngunnawal people we're on today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So just to let you know, I'm a physicist as well and I'm actually an instrument maker too, so I'm wildly jealous about this because when I went through university, the idea of being successful as a physicist was to publish a paper in a great journal and move on to the next thing. And uh, time has moved on so that the expectations of the modern researcher is quite different. And not only do we want them to publish great papers, win a Nobel Prize, um, and uh, we want them to spin out a company too. And maybe Daniel and his team haven't quite got the Nobel Prize yet, but we'll be waiting. I, um, I did, though, through my time when I previously worked at CSIRO, saw the power of science, and particularly physics, and its measurement and creating sensors and systems that can be fashioned into, into um, capabilities that can really make a difference. So uh, my own area of research was in uh, super, superconducting electronics, and, uh, and we developed a device that could detect magnetic fields and use for mineral exploration. And uh, this was, we're getting on to nearly 30 years ago, which is pretty, pretty scary when you think it was that long ago. But we, at that stage, had a very limited idea of what commercialization looks like. And uh, the idea was to license it out and have another company manufacture it, which we did do. It's a system called Lantem, and I'm sure you all know it very well. There's about 30, well, no, probably about 13 systems in the world. They're used to discover um, deeply buried mineral deposits, and they have a life of their own, and we occasionally make the devices to uh, replace the sensor system. But things have moved on since then, and we've now got to a point where we're seeing the opportunity that science, and particularly uh, in this case, the physics community in Australia, has really transitioned from 10 years ago where I think we would say around 2010, most of the researchers in particularly the university system just saw the endpoint as being that fabulous paper that was published and the accolades that go with it. But what we're seeing is this amazing transition where people are going that extra mile and taking that risk and spinning out their companies and creating jobs and growth, but also capabilities which will allow things to happen which couldn't happen before. So I'm really pleased that Liquid Instruments has uh, developed their, their uh, I guess it's their lab in a, in a brief or a backpack. I um, think that's fantastic. The reason being that I've got this idea of a, a sort of a new way of science which uh, has come out of the COVID pandemic where instead of every one of us having our own laboratory with all the tools and, and we have all the instruments and we do everything ourselves, that we move to a, a, a new model where all of us are able to be part of, it's almost like the conceptual scientists, so like conceptual artists, you don't do it all yourself, but you have people who are specialists building all the bits that come together to allow your uh, breakthrough to happen. I see the, um, the new, um, what is it, the Moku Go to be the, um, a, a way of actually progressing this idea of, for example, can you have, uh, do science on your kitchen table so you can do uh, research anywhere and uh, still be looking after the kids while the toddlers are, um, are in the back room asleep. So these are the sorts of things which I'm really excited about because I think this particular um, um, new product is going to be something which will have a major impact. So just to finish up, one of the things I do want to remind everyone is that science alone, and it's terrible that I'm the Australia's chief scientist saying this, but it's true, is that science alone doesn't do very much. It creates new knowledge, but it only makes an impact when we do the other stuff that's with it. We have to translate that science into something that's an engineered outcome so it can be used. We have to have a design, so we have to engage with the um, arts to be able to have a, a user interface that people want to use it and find it easy to use. I don't know how often you've come across something which is great concept, but boy, is it horrible to use, and so you throw it in the bin instead of using it. We need to make sure that we have the social license, that the community is willing to actually accept whatever the new technology is, and we bring the community along with us. This is going to be particularly important as we move towards quantum technologies, and that's something which I know we're looking at very closely. 
We also need to make sure that we have uh, the business model that works. And as I mentioned before, when I was trying to commercialise my, my system, we had just one sort of model. Now we're seeing a whole range of them that, and the uh, support and potential of being able to spin out your own company means that this gives a huge opening to a range of different career pathways. And so for the young people here, I hope that you don't think that the only career pathway, if you have a science, technology, engineering and mathematics um, background, is going through an academic one, although that can lead to great opportunities and great things to happen. I'm hoping that you can see, and you will see, a whole range of career pathways which are in business, in government, as well as in publicly funded agencies in the university sector. Um, and then I guess the final thing is to make this all come together, we also need to have the, the government to provide the resources to support this, as well as the uh, regulatory sit, uh, and, and standards that allow us to make sure that we can trade internationally. So if you think about physics plus as not just being physics and on its own, and it needs to have all those other things I mentioned to make something happen, I think we're gonna see an amazing thing come out of the wonderful research that we've got in Australia, where we've got so much of it, particularly in physics, but in other areas too, as world leading. And this today is a tangible impact and result of uh, someone like Daniel and his team taking that extra, um, I guess, risk and really pushing the system to be able to, with the support, turn something of an idea into a reality. So congratulations, it's a fantastic story. And I'm just so pleased to be able to be part of your launch today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for your leadership uh, as chief scientist, helping uh, the you know the really cutting edge science and technology that we have here within our university, CSIRO, and other research organizations, making sure that we make it accessible uh, for all of Australia to understand and love, making sure that anyone in Australia uh, is able to be part of this really exciting uh, part of what Australia does so well and then being able to show the way of how to translate these things to things that actually will make our lives better. And so your, uh, your leadership and your inspiration in this space is uh, really appreciated and it's a true pleasure to work with you. Back in 2016, Liquid Instruments launched its first product, Moku Lab, an advanced electrical test platform for scientists and engineers. The technology behind Moku Lab was initially developed for gravitational wave detectors and is now orbiting um, on the NASA's climate monitoring mission, the GRACE follow-on. And uh, I certainly uh, learned about this uh, back uh, when Professor Daniel Shattuck, when he was not a professor at the time, was telling me about his idea behind creating the measuring device that uh, he launched in 2016. It is a great example of how absolutely foundational work here at a university, ANU, can translate into revolutionary new products and companies. By being able to measure things really accurately, you can actually overturn the way we do things. And being able to take something that was only available in the best labs in specific places in the world and bringing that out so anyone can use that level of precision, we haven't even begun to think about how that's gonna change the way we can actually approach hard problems out in the field with not just a few people, but literally thousands of people being able to use this technology. Liquid Instruments has been built by a world-leading team made up mainly of ANU physicists, but it brings others along, uh, as well as other scientists and, of course, many of our graduates. Liquid Instruments CEO, Professor Daniel Shattuck, who is, as you uh, guessed, a professor here at ANU, has worked incredibly hard, tirelessly, and I have seen this, with his team to bring to market technology that we see as helping students, people who are making things, and researchers learn, create, and discover using this precision measuring device. It's very exciting that everyone here is able to be part of our first Silicon Valley-like product launch. And so, without further ado, please welcome me in welcoming Professor Daniel Shattuck to the stage. Dan? Hi, everyone. 
Uh, thanks, thanks for coming by today. It's great to see people looking so three-dimensional. It's weird not seeing everyone on a computer screen. Uh, it's great that you, you could get out of the house and, and make it down here today. Um, today I'm going to share with you the Liquid Instruments story. It's a story about who we are, where we came from, and, and where we're trying to go. Liquid Instruments exists at the crossroads of science and technology. And the way I think about science is science is important for many reasons, but really science is the light in the darkness for humanity. It helps us understand the universe and it helps us understand our place in it. Whereas technology helps us master it. It's what allows us to take control of things, to know the rules, but then build the things that will change the way our world is. And we believe that technology is the solution to some of the world's greatest challenges. This ranging from climate change, uh, to improving people's health care, to helping people lift themselves out of poverty with better education. There's a whole range of things that technology can, can contribute to if we have the people to push that technology forward. So today I'm going to talk a lot about science and a lot about technology. Um, all technology really at some point was based in science, but increasingly today all scientific breakthroughs rely on advances in technologies. And that's where Liquid Instruments likes to work. We are in this virtuous whirlpool of science and technology. We're working with scientists and engineers to keep pushing forward technology to give us the solutions that we want. And how do we do that? Well, what Liquid Instruments does is we make technology that builds technology. And I'll show you today some examples of that. So let's start a little bit back in my career. And I'm going to talk about three projects which have really shaped my career and the careers of many of the Liquid Instruments team members over the last couple of decades. The three projects are LIGO, a gravitational wave detector, LISA, a space-based gravitational wave detector that's planned in the next 10 to 20 years, and then GRACE follow-on, something that has launched uh, only five years ago. Um, LIGO was a real revelation for physics. You may have heard of LIGO. It was the first direct detection of this thing called gravitational waves. And it really pushed forward measurement science and measurement technology in so many different areas, all at the same time. And this ranges from, ranges from lasers to optics to control systems to data processing and data analysis to material science and even pushing and surpassing the fundamental limits set by quantum mechanics itself on measurements. It was a real success story. It took a long time and a lot of work by more than 1,000 people working for decades. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll talk about how that LIGO technology was then adapted and extended to become more useful in other areas, to become more robust, and to be able to go out into places like into space, into the harsh environment of, of orbit or even in deep space, and, and extend those measurement technologies even further. So gravitational waves. This is a, an artist's impression, thanks to Osgrav, um, of a couple of, I think these are binary neutron stars, but it could be any heavy, compact, dense object in space. So black holes is, is the typical one that we see. And so these are two black holes that were floating out in the distant, distant universe, and they became caught in each other's gravitational potential, and they started to orbit around each other. And as they orbit around each other, because they're moving very quickly and they're also very massive, they start to drag space itself around with them. And when they do that, they warp space-time, they distort it. And when they do that, they lose a little bit of energy. And when you lose energy in an orbit, you start to spiral in together. And that makes these things then move faster, emit even more gravitational waves, get closer together, and eventually this process ends up in an in-spiral and a coalescence, a merging of these black holes. So 1.3 billion years ago, this happened out in the distant universe. Two black holes, around about 30 times the mass of our sun, got caught in each other's potential, and after many, many millions of years, eventually coalesced and merged, letting out an enormous amount of energy. In fact, in the last fraction of a second that these, uh, in the merger, they let out 50 times more power than all of the stars in all of the combined observable universe together. So it's a really enormous amount of energy, and this was all emitted as gravitational waves. And so then these gravitational waves propagate through space. And here's a, a lovely example of what happens as they propagate through space. So what you see here is the gravitational wave going from right to left through space. And as it moves, the effect that it has on space is to distort space or stretch it and compress it in different directions. And so to measure these things now, if we have some objects that we can measure the separation of as a gravitational wave passes, then we can measure that gravitational wave. We can directly detect that gravitational wave. The big problem is that this effect is tiny. Although there's so much energy in these waves, space is very, very stiff. 
And the motion caused by this, or the change in the separation of these objects, is, is really very small. If a large gravitational wave, such as the one that was, was uh, shown earlier, was to pass between the Earth and the Sun, they would get closer together and farther apart by around the diameter of a hydrogen atom. So it's a very, very tiny effect and very, very difficult to measure. But it didn't stop people trying to measure it. So around the 1980s, there was a big effort put together, uh, led by the US with collaborators in Germany, in the UK, and here in Australia, to build these LIGO detectors. Now LIGO is, this is the central building here, LIGO is a laser interferometer. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And it shoots these laser beams along these two arms, which are vacuum systems, to suck all of the air out and down to a mirror at the very, very end. And the idea was, as a gravitational wave passes through Earth, the separation between the mirror at the end and a mirror in this uh, central station would change very slightly. And we could measure that change using laser interferometry, which is the most sensitive technique we know about. This is a cartoon of a laser interferometer. If I start talking about this, you're gonna be here for about six hours. So I'm not really gonna to talk too much about that, other than to say it uses this technique called interference, or phenomenon called inter interference, where the waves, the laser beam propagates down to the ends, bounces off these mirrors, and comes back and interferes together, and either adds or subtracts. And the idea is if these mirrors move a very tiny amount, then it changes the phase of that beam in such a way that it changes the interference, and we can then measure that and infer the passing of a gravitational wave. The problem is, it's a very small effect. So here is an atom. And we're gonna show you how small the gravitational wave was, how much it moved the mirrors by. We're zooming in now on that atom down to the proton, to the nucleus there. We're zooming in on the side of that nucleus, and when the gravitational wave passed through the LIGO detectors, it moved the mirrors by this much. There's people laughing here, and you're right to laugh. Uh, but that was enough, that was enough to measure. And this is the measurement that saw it. So, so that motion that you can see on these two detectors uh, was about the same level that I showed in that, in that animation. And the reason we have two detectors is actually the same reason we have two ears. We can, we can hear better with two ears, but we can also vaguely pick out the directions that sounds are coming from. And so LIGO built two detectors, we saw the signal in both, and so we knew that it was real. And as a result of this, uh, Ray, Kip, and Barry were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017. Um, but it was also the work of a thousand researchers working for decades to get this to happen. So LIGO can't see everything. There are certain sources that LIGO can't see, and there's a lot of sources that are much bigger than 30 solar masses that are floating around out in space. And they happen a lot more frequently, and they last a lot longer. And if we want to see those sources, we won't be able to do that with LIGO, because there's just too many disturbances on the ground that would obscure the signal. So the solution is, if we want to see a, a, a merger like this, which is two galaxies colliding, which has, have supermassive black holes in the center, about a million times the mass of the sun, then we need to go into space. And that's what this LISA project is all about. And so I've spent a large part of my career planning and developing technology for LISA. Um, and when I first heard about it, I thought, okay, so we have LIGO, the most sensitive measuring device ever made by humanity. It has 100,000 measurement channels that are running all the time. It takes an army of graduate students and postdocs and engineers to keep the thing running and, and working correctly. And now we want to take all of that, we want to put it in a rocket, we want to launch it into space, we want to have it set itself up, and then we want to have it measuring for 10 years without anybody touching. It sounds impossible and it sounds crazy. And it is crazy, but it's not impossible. And in fact, we already have the technology to do this mission. And how do we know that? We know it because we've already taken that technology and put it into another mission for an entirely different purpose. So unlike with gravitational wave detectors where we're looking out into the universe to learn about the universe and learn about the cosmos, GRACE is a mission that looks inward at Earth and it tries to map the gravitational potential of the Earth. Why would you do this? Well, you do this because you can learn a lot about the Earth system. In fact, if you can measure the geoid, which is what this gravitational map is called, if you can measure the geoid of the Earth very, very accurately, and you can measure it over a period of time, then the changes in that geoid tell you something about how mass is moving around the surface of the Earth. It tells you about how mass is moving the oceans, and it also tells you how mass is moving under the surface of the Earth. But the only thing that really moves under or on or around the surface of the Earth on those sort of timescales is water. So GRACE is actually a hydrology mission. It tells us about sea level changes, it tells us about groundwater in the Murray-Darling Basin, and it also tells us, gives us a map every month of melting of polar ice in, in Antarctica and in Greenland. So GRACE was flying in 2002, and how do you measure this geoid? Well, it turns out the best way to measure it is you have two spacecraft. You have two spacecraft, 
following each other, one chasing the other, and they're flying around the Earth, and you have them in as low orbit as possible, and that gives you the best gravitational wave signal. And then, because there's still some atmosphere there, you have some accelerometers, which allow you to measure the buffeting of, of the spacecraft by those residual uh, molecules in the air, um, because it is moving at seven kilometers a second. And then you can subtract that signal out and measure the separation. And the idea is, as one of the spacecraft approaches a, an area of large mass, it will speed up and then slow down a little bit. And the second spacecraft, following a little bit later, will do the same thing. And the, the separation of those spacecraft has now changed over that period. And if we can measure that change very accurately, we can invert that change, we can calculate the gravitational potential. Um, but again, it's very, very accurate. We have to measure, uh, for GRACE, uh, the measurement was around about the diameter of a red blood cell separation between two spacecraft that were 200 kilometers apart. So it's a really incredible small change on a really hard environment with spacecraft moving at 25,000 kilometers an hour. GRACE follow-on mission was a, a follow-on to GRACE. GRACE is the Gravity Recovery and Climate Ex Experiment, and GRACE follow-on had an, an important upgrade. It took the technology from LISA that was planned to be used for LISA, a laser interferometer, and it built the first interspacecraft laser interferometer in space. And what that allowed people to do is it allowed people to make, take the measurement of GRACE, which was already an amazingly impressive feat, and improve the sensitivity by 5,000 times just by adding a laser. And there were people sitting in this room who have played a major part in, uh, in building that system. It all got boxed up. It got put onto a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, in May 2018. And since then, it's been a runaway success. The laser has never dropped lock. It's done 1,500 orbits now. Um, and as I said, it is 5,000 times more sensitive than the original GRACE mission. So really fantastic work. This is a paper talking about the performance. And this paper has the fingerprints of many people in liquid instruments that I wanted to point out. But it's a great example of the types of things that this sort of technology can do. So to get something like GRACE working, there are so many different systems that all have to work together. So many different measurements, so many different sensors, and so many different control systems and actuators that all have to work in concert for this to work. So here's an example where before you can initiate the laser link, these two spacecraft lasers have to find each other. They have this complicated scan, and they both have to be pointing directly at each other at the same time, and they also have to have their frequencies be within a certain range. So it's a five degree of freedom scan. And one of our co-founders, Danielle Wuchinich's PhD, was helping to develop this system with colleagues in Hanover and at JPL. In addition to that, the laser frequency has to be stabilized. So Liquid Instruments CTO Tim Lamb helped develop the FPGA-based system that does the laser frequency control for the GRACE frequency stabilization system. And the primary measurement itself, the measuring of the phase of the interferometer, I've spent far, far too many years of my life working on this instrument called a phase meter, which is, was really the genesis for liquid instruments. And so all these measurements are happening on GRACE follow-on. And they all happen using this very interesting type of technology that enables them, and that's called an FPGA. So I'm going to stop there and talk about FPGAs for a little while because it's a really core technology. Many of you may have heard about it already. Some of you may have not. So FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array, and it's a different type of computing chip. It's a computing chip that has really three things that you need to know about it to understand why it's important for us. The first one is that they're incredibly powerful. They are very efficient, and they have massive parallel processing. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. The second one is that they are completely reconfigurable. When I first heard of the term field programmable, I thought that meant there was some magnetic field or something that was, was flipping all the bits in the, in the device to make it so that it could be changed. But it actually means, no, programmable out in the field. You, you can just take it out. Once it's in a device, you can reprogram it, and it can do something else completely different. Um, and the third one, which is interesting from a liquid instruments perspective, is they're actually very difficult to program. And if you have the, the people and the team and the skills to program those things, that's actually quite valuable. Maybe the best way to understand why FPGAs are important is to compare them to other common types of, of processing systems. So here are the sort of four common ones, and I've arranged them in, a, in an order from flexibility on the left to the most efficient on the right. So a CPU is what's inside everybody's laptop computer and your phone. You're all familiar with that. It has typically one or two or four or 16 cores, and it can do a bunch of very different operations quite fast. If we want to go even faster, though, and even more parallel, we can go to a GPU, which is in graphics cards. And these might have up to 1,000 cores now that are processing different instructions, typically much simpler instructions, but they can do it much faster and in parallel. 
And FPGA is really the extreme example of this, where instead of having processor cores, it has logic that you can wire up in different ways and reconnect it in, in a fraction of a second. And then finally, we have an ASIC, which is the most efficient, but it has no flexibility at all. Um, and so many of the systems that you would have would have an ASIC inside when they're mass reduced because it's much cheaper, they can be very efficient, and uh, if you're making a million of them, it makes sense. So FPGA is interesting for us because FPGA is the penultimate in efficiency, but it still has some flexibility, and that's really important. Uh, and how we use that flexibility is important. So we took this technology, and we became experts in programming FPGAs, and then we thought, what can we do? Grace had launched, uh, it was a wonderful success. LIGO had detected gravitational waves. Uh, we thought, what if we took this technology and looked for something else a little bit closer to home uh, to apply it to? And we didn't really have to look too far. We looked around our own labs, and we looked at the sort of technology that we used, and uh, it turns out this test and measurement equipment is everywhere. And it's actually a very foundational technology for a lot of industries. It underpins all of the technology in telecommunications and semiconductor and aerospace and defense and, and large industries like that. And so if, if, we, if we found someone that cared about measurements, and we had in this industry, what if we tried to do a better job? What if we tried to apply our approach to it uh, to make it easier? And the one thing we could, we could see straight away is there are thousands of different applications for test and measurement technology. And there's probably 100 boxes that you would buy. And each box does a particular thing. Uh, it probably has an ASIC inside. It does that, it's designed to do that thing very well. And it typically does. But if you want to do a different measurement, you need to buy a different box. And we thought, maybe with our FPGA technology, we could, we could maybe make that so it wasn't necessary. So we started Liquid Instruments. After, not long after we finished our work on the, on the GRACE project, uh, the team, before they all disappeared, uh, we decided we would try and do something uh, in, in the test and measurement space. And so this is our idea. This is actually very similar to the very first pitch deck I ever showed to a venture capitalist uh, back in 2014. And basically the idea is this. It's a single device with a powerful reconfigurable FPGA inside. It has a couple of other key components. It has analog inputs for getting signals in from the real world. It has analog outputs for generating signals and, and delivering them to the real world. And then it has networking, which means we can plug it into a much more powerful computer down the line. And the second part was this tablet-based user interface, which offers a real breakthrough in usability and mobility. And it's actually required for this system that you have a, a reconfigurable user interface because you have reconfigurable hardware. So it's not enough to do it in the conventional way where we have a, a set of fixed buttons on the front. We really need it to be dynamic and adaptable. And so we launched in 2015 with three instruments. We had a, uh, an oscilloscope, a phase meter, and a spectrum analyzer. And because of the nature of the technology, because it's really software-defined hardware, we were able to then update it as a software download for our users, where instead of buying another box or another box or another box, they simply updated the app on the iPad, and they received a new instrument. And now, after doing that for a few years, we're now at 12 instruments now. So this one device can replace 12 individual standalone instruments. The user interface is really the crown jewels of Liquid Instruments, and it's very difficult to get across in a PowerPoint presentation just how different it is to the conventional, uh, conventional approach and how really delightful it is to use. I think part of this is because the people who design that user interface are users themselves. And so they know what they do, they know how to use it, they know what is annoying, and they know how to fix it. Um, and so that's something that really has to be tried out to be believed. And I would encourage you all to go and download the app. You can play around with it and try the user interface uh, for yourself with all of the instruments without any hardware, just in demonstration mode. And you'll see a demonstration later on about that. So that's where we got to uh, with Liquid Instruments. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the other founding team members. And so we have a short video that I'm going to show you now. I think from the very beginning, Liquid Instruments has always been focused on the users. This is partly because we are users ourselves. We built something that we would love, that we would want to use. And then maybe there's lots of people like us who will also want to use it. And that's really what started the company. I actually think there's a lot of smart people around the world. And what they do can actually improve our technology and make the world a better place and I just want to be able to enable that. We thought if we tried to not only combine the functionality of multiple instruments but also improve the user experience that might be something that would be really powerful and beneficial to a lot of people. As soon as I heard about this new technology I, I immediately thought you know this is the future of, of test and measurement and I wanted to be part of it working on something that modernized 
The way we operate in the lab was something that really excited me. When I think about the start of the company, I think about all of us crammed into this really small, sweaty office. You know, we had really big plans and ideas then, and that part hasn't changed. I was 60 when I started my PhD, which is absurdly old to do something like that, and a great privilege. But it, it's like a second or third career. It was something brand new that I could get involved with. And it, I, I think I'm very lucky to have stumbled into this and been able to play a part in it. It's being at the forefront, the crest of a wave, and seeing this transition. And I think people will look back at this period as when the whole game changed. So what our products hope to provide is a common hardware platform that can be used in many different ways, allowing users to build their own bespoke experiments, potentially in ways that we haven't thought of yet. In the past, when you bought a piece of equipment, it could already do everything that it was ever going to be able to do. And that's no longer true with the products that we're making now. Now what we've stumbled upon is the computer of test and measurement. And our technology just enables them to focus on the things that they're really good at and not worry about the things that are already done. As a scientist, I wanted to create something that would not only be used for cutting edge research, but also help train the next generation of scientists and engineers who will push the boundaries even further. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of spaces for us to grow in and I think once they discover what we have to offer, uh, they will love it. Don't be afraid to do something that everybody thinks is crazy or stupid or impossible because a lot of crazy, stupid, impossible things have come off and they only come off if there's people there who believe in them and push them and devote their careers to it. I think in 10 years time, Mokus and devices like Mokus will be the only real option for any sort of scientific instrumentation and will have been the guys that were the catalyst for that change. So that's Moku Lab and we have now more than a thousand users around the world uh, in 30 countries and uh, they're doing some amazing things with it. And I, I love hearing about what they do. I think last week I was hearing about somebody at Harvard Medical School that is analyzing uh, cancer tumors using a new type of microscope that is driven by the Moku Lab. Um, we had a customer who was monitoring the transmission of fiber lines under the Pacific to Hawaii to measure the fidelity of those signals coming through the fiber. Uh, we had somebody here at ANU who was using the very high speed response of the Moku Lab to time resolve the slippage events in earthquakes. Uh, something that hadn't been done before. And so there's really just so many different applications and it's very interesting to hear about those. The one that I love here is the smile that you see on this user's face because it really is just nice to use. It, it almost ruins you for other equipment, it's a shame. Um, then we noticed that a lot of our users, a significant fraction of our users, were not the ones that we had really designed it for. These were users who were in education, in undergraduate education at universities. And there was about 25 universities that were, had all put Moku Labs into their undergraduate curriculum. And we had never designed it for this. It was far too expensive, we thought, for this. And they didn't really care about the uh, really low noise analog inputs or the precision oscillator that was on board. They liked it because of the student engagement they saw. They found it, students found it as a really easy, unintimidating way of getting to know lab equipment and understanding the core concepts. I'll just show you what a typical undergraduate lab looks like. So this is an undergraduate lab. It's not very different from a lab you would find anywhere in the world. And you typically have this stack of equipment that you need for a lab setup. Um, and it's not just stacked like this for the photo. You can see in the background, there are many other stations. This is how it's set up. You buy all this equipment. They're all individual boxes and you need five or six different types of equipment to do your typical labs, and you put them at stations. They cost between $1,500 and $3,000 for, for one of these stations. Um, and then you can't afford too many, so students have to share them or in groups or in pairs. Um, and it's actually not a really lovely experience for a, a new student who doesn't understand the technology, doesn't understand the concepts you're trying to teach, to try and learn both these things at the same time. And it, it just seems not fair. I think science and engineers are really important to the world. We should be doing everything we can to support them and encourage them and, and not have them turned off by a poor undergraduate experience. And so one of the things that, that we see often is that the equipment that gets sent to undergraduate labs from, from the major manufacturers is really just their cheapest version hobbled even further so they can sell it at cost without eroding their market. And that's just not good enough. We just have to do better than that. 
And I think we can do better. And so earlier this month, we, we brought out something that we've been working on for a long time. Um, and it's called the Moku Go, and I'll show you a short video. So that's a Moku Go. So all of that equipment you saw before, all of that is in here. It's small enough to fit in a freaking backpack. It comes with a Mac or Windows app that you can run on the devices that students already own and take to school. Um, and we think it's going to be a really big deal. And like we said, it comes in different colors. They're customizable colors, so we could do some special ANU ones. If you want to put an order for 100,000, Brian, we could, <laughs> we could change the color. Um, so how much does it cost? Well, education is really important to hit a low price point if we want this to be able to have every student to have their own one of these. So we worked really, really hard. Moku Lab, it's 3,500 to 10,000. With the Moku Go, uh, the specs are not quite as good on the noise and the bandwidth, but it's also added digital inputs and outputs. Uh, it's also added power supplies, and we can do it for $499, which is great. So I think with this, it'll be a really a breath of fresh air for the education space. So now I've got something really cool to show you. Um, yeah, let me come over here. So this is something that we've been working on for two and a half years. Something pretty cool. This is not the cool thing. This is, this is the old thing. So these are all actual pieces of equipment from my old lab, and I've used all of these pieces of equipment over the years. Um, and what I'm going to show you is something that will replace everything that that does for me. I can now use this other system.
And here's one in the flesh to show you that it's real. So this is the Moku Pro. It's many years in the making. Um, it's a really impressive thing. What a magnificent beast you are. <laughs> so how good is it? We, didn't, we talked a little bit about specs, but let's just compare it to the Moku Lab, something that we, we made, uh, it's been on the market for a few years now. So the Moku Pro you saw, the Moku Lab has two inputs, two outputs. Moku Pro has, has four, twice as good. Um, the output voltage is a lot higher now on the Moku Pro. We've got five times the output voltage of the Moku Lab. Um, the data logging rate is also a lot faster. It's 10 times the rate. So a lot of times with, with this sort of equipment, it, it increases at 10, 20% per generation. So this is a 1,000% increase. Um, sample rate also 10 times faster, five giga samples per second uh, for characterizing really high speed signals. Data storage, 230 times more. And memory depth goes from 16,000 points. One of our most requested features on the lab is to increase the memory depth. Moku Pro can do 100 million points, 6,000 times more than the lab. Good luck processing all of that on your laptop. <laughs> so don't take my word for it now. I'm going to introduce, uh, call up Sibi from Baraha, the CTO and co-founder of Baraha, who's been using the Moku Pro in, in his lab for the last couple of weeks. Thanks, Sibi. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us up in Canberra. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Baraha and what we're doing with the Moku. So a little bit about us. So we're based in Sydney. Uh, we got together in 2015 to really address a problem with self-driving cars, which is they need eyes, and we had an idea that was going to revolutionize this. We make the laser eyes of self-driving cars. We are about 150 people, mostly based in Sydney. Um, and one of the reasons that I come up to Canberra so often is I'm really excited by the quality of the graduates that come out of ANU. And this year we'll be hiring 10 graduate engineering positions. This is people that graduate with no experience. Come work at Baraha, be a part of the autonomous revolution, and get yourself a really amazing experience. Now, Dan and I go way back. I know him uh, when he started the company. Um, and back in 2016, he asked me, look, how does your LiDAR work? What is spectrum scan? I said, Dan, it's pretty easy. You know how a piece of glass, if you put white light into that, it's going to end up with a rainbow. Well, the interesting thing about that is that if you replace the white light with individual colors of laser, this is going to deflect the beam at unique angles. So we're actually able to steer a beam with no moving parts. Dan said, yeah, I understand that. But are you going to shoot visible lasers at people? That's not going to make sense. I said, Dan, don't worry about it. We're not going to use visible. We're going to use infrared. It's invisible to you and me. It's going to be eye safe for the public. But we're doing the same thing. We've got a laser that uses infrared light. We're going to change the color rapidly, and it's going to scan the environment with no moving parts. He said, I get that. Why is that important? Well, think of it from inside the prism. As we're changing the colors of light, we are then steering the beam. And what does that look like? Every color, every wavelength is a line. And as we play more colors, we're getting more lines in the field of view. And as you can see, that the more colors you can play, the increased resolution is going to give you a much richer look of what's in front of the vehicle. Additionally, because there's no moving parts, we can do this arbitrarily. We can concentrate those colors to be at the top or at the bottom or anywhere in the field of view we want. And this is something no one else in the world can do. Only Baraha has this technology. And that's how we're able to give customized scan patterns to our customers, uh, and that enables their, them to have fully autonomous vehicles. What does this look like in practice? This is the point cloud from one of our LiDAR devices. Here's a pedestrian walking down the road. And you can see as he walked down the road, we're going to change the scan patterns on the fly. This is real output from a sensor, technology that we design, we've invented, and we manufacture here in Australia. At the very limit of this, if we take all the points that we can generate and we can take a very high resolution scan, this is an image taken at a marina in San Francisco where you can see that the incredible resolution gives a very thorough 3D picture. This is over 200 meters of uh, range that we're able to see really small objects like the, the lines and the mass of these boats. So incredible technology. How did we get there? Well, we started in the lab. Now, Dan sent me one of the first Moku Pros, and it's sitting in our lab right now. And the classic problem that we have at Baraha is, well, we have lasers to emit light, and we have detectors to receive light. And then we do the invention of the crazy optics. That's what we have the team to do. But the problem is always, as Dan said, is we have a pile of equipment sitting on the bench waiting to be interconnected. 
Well, the Moku Pro addresses all of this, that the incredible performance and the integration into one box enables our engineers to do this faster uh, and, at a, and with performance specs that can't be beat, really. And there's the picture, the very first Moku Pro sitting in our lab, and what you can't see is all the crazy equipment off to the side. We've cleaned up the lab for you. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Dibby. Uh, Ibraha is probably the hottest Australian tech startup, so really appreciate you coming down to talk about it today, Sibi. So that's the Moku Pro. Um, there's a few other things to talk about that I just wanted to let you know. There's lots of cool stuff in it we could talk for a long time. One thing that is a technology that's new for us and I think really interesting, and it addresses one of the big challenges of this type of instrumentation. The fact that we can do so many different things means that we have to design our hardware, the front end hardware that takes the signals from the real world in to be able to do all those things. And that's actually a, a really big challenge that the hardware team have, have worked very hard on. And the problem is that, uh, like a speaker system, for example, if we only have a single cone in our speaker, we can't produce all of the frequencies that we want. So most speakers have a tweeter to make the high frequency sounds and a woofer to make the lower frequency sounds. And they can send the audio through to both of these things uh, with appropriate filtering in between. So we thought, why don't we do this? And so we have this technique called blending, and it basically works like this in reverse, where instead of having one ADC that tries to do all of the frequencies very, very well all of the time, we have one very fast ADC for high frequency signals, and we have one very precise ADC for low frequency signals. So one of them samples at five giga samples per second with 10 bits, one of them samples at 18 bits at 10 mega samples per second. The problem is how do you combine these things? And in the past, this hasn't really been possible because there's an enormous amount of processing needed to blend these two efficiently. If only we had a really big FPGA somewhere on board. And it turns out, of course, with Moku Pro we do. So this is the system that's implemented on, on every Moku Pro. And what it does is you don't even have to think about it. You, you plug in your signal, it gets routed to both ADCs on every input, and you always get a pristine signal. And I'll just show you what this looks like if we didn't have this in here. So we're using a really high quality, very, very precise, high speed ADC. And if all we had was that high speed ADC, at some point, it's when the signal becomes so small, it will be very hard to make out amongst the background noise. But now if we turn on this blending technology by turning on the second ADC and combining these things with a, a very fast, low latency algorithm, this is what the signal looks like. So you can see it really makes a massive difference to the noise, the precision, the sensitivity that you can get in this device. And it means that now you just don't have to worry about what you plug in. You know that the Moku Pro has got you covered from RF down to acoustic frequencies. Um, so that's one little thing that's, that's extra in the Moku Pro that you won't see anywhere else. So now we're just going to have a little bit of a hands-on demonstration. I'd like to welcome on my colleague, Dr. Nandi Wu, to the stage. Um, Nandi is an application engineer at Liquid Instruments. She's also a graduate from the ANU. So Nandi did her PhD in perovskite uh, photovoltaics. And she's going to give you a bit of a run-through of the Moku Pro user interface. Thanks, Nandi. Hello. So are we ready for some demonstration? I think we've heard a lot about the Moku Pro. We've heard a, a lot about how magical this thing is. So how do we actually use these instruments? So let's take a look together, and let's demonstrate a few instruments that we commonly use and maybe something that you haven't used before. So once you're connected to a Moku Pro, you will be able to see all the instruments that are available on the platform. So normally, any of these icons will be a separate box on your bench top, taking up your space. But what we can do is, through our very powerful software, we can put all of these onto the same hardware platform. So your Moku can be a waveform generator. It can be a data logger. It can be a face meter. It can be any of these things. So let's start with the most commonly used test and measurement instrument, an oscilloscope. So once we deploy the instrument, the Moku Pro now is an oscilloscope. So you can see all the signal on the main user interface. And all the controls are down the right-hand side, as you would expect. So here we can change our coupling, so AC-DC coupling. We can also change our input impedance. And if there's any channel that you're not using, we can switch them off. And once you feel like you've done setting up with your oscilloscope, we can fold it away. So now you have the entire screen to play with your signal. So we can drag your signal around. This is like 
how you would expect with any iPad software. So we can bring them to anywhere we would like. We can also add a histogram to any of the channels. So when it comes to measuring the signal, what we can do is we can bring out some cursors. So to add time cursor, we can slide horizontally to add time cursors. And if we want to measure voltage, we just slide up. And if you feel like you would like to track a certain waveform property, we can also have a tracking cursor. Alternatively, what we can also do is to use automatic measurements. So here we have lots of options, a lot of pre-built-in measurement that we can do. And what's really amazing is we can also measure difference between two channels. And another feature that I really like is that we can also track how each of these measurements is varying over time. And we can also look at it in real time. And once you feel like, you know what, I'm ready to capture this signal, I'm ready to save the data, we can save it anywhere we want to. So here, we can save the capture trace, we can save your measurement setting, we can also save a screenshot if you've got a really cool feature that you would like to look at later on. So we can use any of these settings. Personally, I normally use MATLAB format so that I can look at my data using MATLAB later on. And of course, we can save it to any of these locations. So it can be locally on your iPad. We can upload it to Dropbox. We can also email it directly to yourself or your collaborators, all from within our app. So this is our oscilloscope. Now that we have looked at an instrument that is most commonly used for looking at a signal, so let's look at another instrument that is used for generating signal, which is our waveform generator. So in our Moku Pro, we have four independent output channels. Each of the channels can generate signal from DC all the way up to 500 megahertz. And of course, all of these waveform properties can be easily adjusted. So we can type in a number. What we can also do is well, slide it on, like magic, right? <laughs> so, and what I also really, really like is that you can define any of these properties, say, in multiple different ways. So right now, we can set a frequency of your waveform, but we can set it as a period as well. So this really works, depends on how you would like to use our instrument. And of course, as a waveform generator, we can also build in different types of modulation. And we have very wide bandwidth modulation that can go above 100 megahertz. And also, we can have a preview about how the modulation looks like. So here, we can adjust the modulation depth. And here, we'll be able to see it changing in this little preview so that we know what waveform, what signal we're generating. So right now, we're using our internal, uh, internal signal to modulate this signal. So we're superimposing this signal onto our output signal. What we can also do is we can use an external signal, which is connected to our Moku. And we can also use another signal that is coming from another output channel. So right now, it's coming from output 2. So if I superimpose a different signal on it, we'll have a different signal coming out of it. So this is our waveform generator. The last instrument that I would like to show off is our, also our most popular instrument, which is a locking amplifier. So a locking amplifier is normally used for isolating tiny, tiny signals in very, very noisy environment. So one great thing about our locking amplifier is it's also a great example of how we can combine different instruments using software. So you probably noticed right now that this user interface is quite different from the other instruments that we've looked at so far. It's one of our block diagram instruments. So what we have noticed is when people are learning how to use an instrument, we often draw block diagrams. But when it comes to actually using it, it looks nothing like it. There's a huge gap between how we learn and how we actually use it. So we thought, why not bring this and put it into our user interface? This way, we can better understand and control our instruments. So just to showcase how flexible our locking amplifier is, if we want to, say, add a PID controller, we can drop a PID controller into our locking amplifier. And this PID controller is fully configurable in the frequency domain. 
And this is great, because that means we can actually visualize the, the transfer function of your controller right here in our system. So we can look at magnitude, we can look at phase. We can also implement a new setting before we even turn it on. So all of these changes that's happening in my iPad right now is also happening in real time in the Moku. And that's how fast we are. So if your system needs a signal source, how do we do that? We can drop in a signal source. So here we have a fully configurable oscillator that we can generate a supply signal. And if you're not sure about how your signal look like, we can also drop in an oscilloscope. And this oscilloscope will use a different probe points. And here we can see different signals at different stages of our locking amplifier. And what is great is we can also see how all of this, these changes is happening in real time as we implement them. So if you would like to log your data at these data points, at these active probe points, we also have a built-in data logger, which is very high sampling rate. We can go up to 10 mega samples per second with our data logger. So this is our locking amplifier. It really is a great example of how we can use software to bring different powerful instruments together and form an even more powerful instrument in the end. So I hope by now you can see that our Mokus are very, very versatile, and yet it's very powerful. And you know what? It's very fun to use. So if you would like to try out all of our instruments, you can download our free app from the App Store. It's called Moku, and it's available right now. You can test out all of our instruments without actually having any hardware in demo mode. But we also have a few demonstrations set up outside. So please come check them out and check out how to use all of our different Moku hardwares today. And that's it for my demonstration. Thank you. Thanks, Nandy. Um, great job. So yeah, please come out and have a play around with it afterwards. And um, yeah, you can, you can try it out for yourself. If you have a, an iPad, you can download it for free on the App Store right now. So Nandy's given you a really complete walkthrough. There's lots more stuff to discover in there. They're very sophisticated user interfaces. They're very different, but if you know one, you kind of know how to use them all at the same time. So Moku Pro, how do you get it? Well, there's two ways to get it. There's a base bundle, which has five standard instruments that pretty much everybody would, would be able to use. And that comes in at $12,000. And then there is the full suite bundle where you get all of our instruments. And that includes the base bundle plus a few extras now. But we do release more instruments over time. We're not allowed to promise that you'll get those instruments for free if you buy the base bundle for accounting reasons. So you will not get instruments for free if you buy the full suite bundle. But it comes in at $20,000, uh, which we think is great value. And it's available today. So you can pick one up today on your way out. <laughs> Um, so that's the Moku Pro. That's where it is right now. We hope that it finds a space in your lab. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to see what people do with it. One of the great things about Moku Pro is that it will get better over time. There's more and more stuff coming from it right now and um, that we don't have available today, but will be in the future. And I'm just going to tell you about two of those things that are coming out. And these are more than just new instruments. This is, this is really new capabilities. The first one is multi-instrument mode. So with the Moku Lab, you typically can replace one of these instruments at a time. But with the Moku Pro, it's got such a big FPGA that what if we took that FPGA, we pop the hood on it, and then we sliced it up into smaller functional FPGAs, which could each run their own instruments independently. And so this is what we've done. Uh, we'll have that where we have up to four instruments, and you can hot swap these instruments in and out. So that means that you can switch out an oscilloscope in one slot for a spectrum analyzer, while your waveform generator doesn't skip a beat, maintains phase coherence, generating its output. I think that's a really valuable feature that now turns the Moku into really a system. The other thing that makes it a really valuable system is that these instruments are connected to each other internally. There's no cables to connect them. So we can now build very sophisticated digital processing pipelines, and they all have 20 gigabits per second communication between all of the instruments. So it's going to be really exciting to see what people do with that. The second thing is probably one of our most requested features with the Moku Lab, and that is for people 
So our users are kind of nerdy, and they know that an FPGA is meant to be programmed and that you can program an FPGA yourself. And they keep asking, can we program the FPGA in the Moku Lab? And up until now, we couldn't, unfortunately. Um, it's actually a really hard thing to do, and it's really hard to do it yourself, and it's really hard to support others doing it. And I, this is one of my favorite quotes um, uh, about software engineering. The first 90% of the code accounts for the first 90% of the development time. The remaining 10% of the code accounts for the other 90% of the development time. And I think it really captures the stage that we've been through as a company for the last year. Um, and now we think that we have something that can help people with this. We think we can help people program the FPGAs in a way that, that adds to what's out there as well in existing solutions. And that is a cloud compile. So what we've done is we've taken all of our infrastructure that we use to make our own instruments, we've packaged all that up, we've hidden it away behind a curtain, and we've given users a nice, simple web browser where they can type in, literally in this case, I typed in one line of code which says DAC1 equals ADC0 plus ADC1. And then you press compile, and that thing, the servers will hum into action, and then a few minutes later, you'll have a bitstream that you can put down onto your Moku Pro and have it running on real hardware. Uh, normally, you would have to download 15 gigabytes of, of compiler tools. You'd have to spend months configuring them all, writing drivers for your ADCs and your DACs and do all of that stuff. We've already done all that, so we're just sharing that with you and giving you this basically a text editor in a web browser that will allow you to do very, very simple things. Um, if you're game, you can also build entirely new instruments for yourself. Um, the one thing that makes this really useful, though, is that we are also enabling this with multi-instrument mode. And what this does is it means that now you can build your own creations and you can plug them in with our devices. This is great for debugging as you're developing these instruments, but it also means you now have a built-in user interface with all of the beautiful multi-touch data saving, everything built in that you can use with your own creations with very little work. So we think this could be quite revolutionary. We think this will get our users really energized about building their own bespoke solutions for the Moku Pro. Um, both of these are coming in September. Um, so here we have the whole Moku family now all together, and the Moku Pro, of course, is available today. So that's pretty much what I had to say today. Um, I want to thank everyone again for coming. I think that hopefully you have a better understanding of why we're doing it and where we're from and where we're going. Um, for me, really, Liquid Instruments was, apart from being my midlife crisis, was about um, thinking about what I wanted to do for the second half of my career. And for the first half of my career, gravitational waves was it. And I couldn't have been luckier by choosing a, an amazing project to work on with amazing people. I can't imagine anything that would be as impactful as gravitational waves has been to physics uh, to, to work on. What are the chances that lightning would strike twice and I would choose something equally as impactful for the second half of my career? Well, the thing I love about Liquid Instruments is I don't really have to because what we're doing now is we're sharing our technology with not one project, but with thousands of projects across the world, and we get to be part of that. And our success is making you successful in what you're doing, and that's what really excites us at Liquid Instruments. I need to say a few words of thanks for the Liquid Instruments team. So this is a photo of the US team taken today. They're all watching this live in a restaurant in San Diego somewhere. Hi, guys. How are you going? Um, a lot of them met each other for the first time today. It's been a pretty rough year in the US uh, with, with this, the COVID situation there, and it's great to see they're all vaccinated now and able to meet up for the first time. So I hope you have a great night, guys. Thanks for hanging in there with us. It's, I know it's been a long road to get here, uh, but we got there in the end, and ha have, have a fun time. Can't wait to catch up in person soon. Um, and then to the, to the team here, to the dev team, They've really worked hard uh, over the last year and a half, but particularly over the last couple of months. And I just want to say a big thank you to the whole... Can everybody stand up who's for Liquid Instruments? Everyone from LI, stand up. You too, Tim. Thanks so much, guys. Really, really appreciate all the, all the long hours of the weekends and the evenings. Um, it's, uh, it's a weird feeling to leave the office at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night and not be the last person at work. Uh, so there's been a lot of people working really hard and really appreciate that. And thanks to all the families and friends who have given up their weekends and evenings over the last couple of months to, to let us get this finished. Uh, we, we got there in the end. And finally, I wanted to thank our users. I mean, that's why we're doing this. Um, we have these great users all over the world, and particularly our Moku Lab users who, who've, who've supported us when the product was new and we were really still finding our feet. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff coming. 
uh, we'll, we look forward to some of the, the new users that we haven't met now who will, will use the Go and the Pro and look forward to helping you and the users of the future. Because um, uh, we're really just getting warmed up and you're gonna hear a lot more from us. Thanks very much.